Pre-calculus students, there's some things that I want you to be able to know how to do in your head. Now, in reality, I don't love doing work in my head because that's where I make mistakes. And if you've probably watched some of my videos, you notice that I always like to show my work step by step when I am teaching. One, it helps my students understand the material. And then two, it helps me avoid making mistakes in myself or so at least my students or you can find where I made a simple error in my head. But the reality is when you are working through pre-calculus concepts, we want you to be able to get to a point where you're comfortable with some fundamental knowledge. So that's that's exactly what I want to cover in this video is the stuff that you should be able to know how to do in your head. And if you decide to do it on your head, maybe you are on a test or an exam and it's really important to make sure you're moving through, you can go ahead and do that. So the number one is going to be factoring. Now, you might look at this one and say, ah, oh, man, I hate when A is going to equal to two. You know, we all know that most factoring quadratic trinomials, we want to be able to get to a point where we can factor them in our head. But a lot of times if I give a student a problem like this, they're like, oh, I gotta work this out. I gotta do the box method, regrouping, diamond method. There's all these simple tips and tricks that we can go ahead and use to be able to factor something like this. But in reality, ladies and gentlemen, you can always remember that a quadratic trinomial can always be broken up into a product of two binomials. Now, this one's actually very easy because if you just think about what are my going to be my products for in one, right? It's going to be one and one and negative one and negative one. So that's my only two options. Now, obviously, since my middle term is going to be positive, I know they have to be positive one and positive one. And then the only thing you really want to be able to do in your head is check the product of your inner and your outer. If that's gonna give you three, then you know that it's going to be factorable. And actually this one's very easy because there's really no other options. Like when you know the factors of your last term, you know that they both have to be positive. Your only option here is one and one. And we know because that is a two X, our only option for our middle or our first term is two X times X. So therefore the factor form of this is two X plus one times X plus one. Okay. The next one is completing the square. Now, I've made a lot, I have made a lot of videos on completing the square because if it's taught in algebra one, algebra two, even goes through pre-calculus and calculus, students just struggle with the concept. And I can understand that, especially when we're dealing with fractions or maybe you know terms that are not as nice as maybe this one. But I think it's really, really important that you have some fundamental foundation understanding of completing the square. So therefore, if you have to complete the square of something simple like this, you can actually do it in your head. Now again, I'm gonna show my steps, but I'm gonna show you exactly what I am thinking about or what I am doing to arrive at completing the square. Remember, when we're trying to complete the square, we're trying to create a perfect square trinomial. So what we wanna do is create a perfect square trinomial out of these first two terms. Now, hopefully with an x squared and a two x, you recognize that a perfect square trinomial can be made. We can rewrite this as x squared plus two x plus one. There's obviously that c equals b divided by two squared. So you could obviously like do the math there, but I just like the familiarity with understanding, oh, this is very similar to this perfect square trinomial. Now, again, we recognize we just can't randomly add a one here, right? If we're gonna add a one, we have to subtract a one. So I look at this and I say, oh, that's an x squared plus two x. I can add a one, subtract a one. This can be factored down because I can do my factoring in my head to an x plus one quantity squared and two minus one is going to be a positive one. Now we have completed the square. Okay, the next one, now let's get into a little bit of trick. Let's get away from this algebra. So we have sine of seven pi over six. I think it's pretty important to not have the unit circle memorized. I'm not a big proponent of that. I think there's a couple things you should know. You should understand what we call the reference angle of this angle, which is going to be pi over six. Whatever your denominator is, that is going to be your reference angle, pi over six. And again, remember the reference angle, what we're concerned about is what is the point that intersects the unit circle from the reference angle. So if I think about the unit circle, I you do want to have the first quadrant memorized. The point for the reference angle of pi over six, so it gets called this like theta prime, right, is going to be pi over six. That's what we call the reference angle. And that coordinate point is going to be square root of three over two, comma one half. Now remember, sine represents the y coordinate, right? Cosine represents x, tangent represents y over x. And then the last thing we need to do is understand, well, which quadrant is this in, right? We should be able to visualize this angle in our head because hopefully you understand that halfway around the circle is pi, which is six pi over six, right? Pi, six pi over six, the same thing. So if I'm at seven pi over six, that means I'm a pi over six over, right? So that means I'm going to be now in the third quadrant. I know in my head, X and Y are both negative in the third quadrant. So all I'm concerned about is what is my Y coordinate? Go to my reference angle. My Y coordinate is one half, but since the angle is in the third quadrant, I know this answer is negative one half. 
All right, the next one is going to be logarithms, and I get it, ladies and gentlemen. Students struggle with evaluating logarithms, but I didn't want to do an easy one, right? I want to do one that has a little bit of complexity to it. A lot of times, once we get familiar with logarithms, we get something that has fractions or radicals, and then we're just totally forget what we are doing, right? So the main thing you want to be able to, you know, look into this, and again, you could always work it out, right? We could always like say, well, let's set this equal to x, and then rewrite this in exponential form. Four to the x equals a one over 64. And then again, if you want them to get the same base, what you can do is rewrite 64 as a 64 to the negative first power. And then you could say, well, four, how do I get to you know, 64? What is that? Well, that's going to equal to a four cubed. But again, that's a four cubed to the negative first power. So four to the x is equal to four to the negative third power. Now you can see using the one to one property, x is equal to a negative three. But again, when I'm looking at this to visualize this in my head, I'm trying to say, all right, well, this is in the denominator, so I know I'm gonna have to rewrite that to a negative power, and then just say four raised to what number gives me 64? It's three. And then again, we still have that negative power, so x equals negative three. Definitely something you should be able to do in your head, as well as other evaluating logarithms. Now, if you're liking this video and you actually are taking pre-calculus, I actually have a whole pre-calculus channel that I'll link down below and multiple pre-calculus playlists that go through all of this content step by step. So therefore, it can be a great aid as you're working through this in your own classroom or online. So the last one is going to be identifying the x, the y intercepts, as well as the asymptotes or holes. Now, again, for a lot of problems, sometimes you might have something that's going to be too difficult that I would rather you work it out. But for a lot of problems, the math can be done rather, rather simply. So I wanna make sure you have the foundation of what you're doing. So therefore, when you're looking at a problem, you're like, oh yeah, I can easily do that in my head. So let's first go over the x and y intercepts. Remember. The x-intercept is when y is equal to zero. Now in this case, we don't have a y, we have f of x, but remember, we can just replace that f of x with a y, and then we can replace that with a zero. So the easiest, fastest way to be able to do this in your head is if I'm gonna now solve for x when I have a fraction equal to zero, the first thing I'd have to do is multiply by my denominator both sides, which is gonna take that to zero anyways. So all you simply need to do is set your numerator equal to zero. Ladies and gentlemen, that's pretty easy to do. You can look at your numerator, set it equal to zero, and say, oh, x is equal to seven. That was not that much brain power. The next one is going to be the y-intercept. Now that is when x is equal to zero. So just think about it. If I plug zero in for all these x's, all I'm gonna be left with is constant over constant. So therefore, what am I gonna have? A negative seven over a negative five. That is going to be seven fifths. All right, and then the last one is going to be finding the asymptotes, asymptotes and holes. So to be able to do that, what we first need to be able to do is factor things, right? Numerator is not factorable. The denominator though, I can factor that into a x minus five times an x plus one. Okay, and then what we wanna look for is, is anything dividing in my numerator as well as in my denominator? If you have two terms that are going to factor out, then therefore, they are going to be what we call a whole. Now in this example that I chose, I did not have any th expressions that can be evenly factored out that are exactly the same in the numerator and the denominator. So in this example, I have no holes. Now it is important, if I did have a hole that actually matched the same value as my x or my y intercept, those would no longer be x and y intercepts because they would actually be a whole. Even though they would satisfy this, the whole would make them a discontinuity. But in this example, my vertical asymptotes, once I have everything in factored form and I've divided out anything I have, I just take the factored form on my denominator and I set it equal to zero. So x minus five times x plus one is equal to zero. Now I'll show you the zero product property, right? Because that's what you should always do. But that's something definitely you could be able to do in your head. And therefore you can easily find the vertical asymptotes as x equals five and x equals one. So hopefully, ladies and gentlemen, you found this video helpful. And again, if you're looking for more pre-calculus help, then check out my pre-calculus channel and all the videos and playlists I have for you there. Cheers.